All right. So thank you for joining us today. We're excited to talk about Jubilee with author Connor Bender. Please post your questions about our discussion in the chat and we'll get to them at the end of the program. Connor went to college, at the, went to the College of Charleston and graduated with a degree in classics. Upon graduation, he commissioned as a second lieutenant in the Marine Corps, where he served as a logistician and for foreign military advisor for six years. Sorry. No worries. <laughs> Being published in the Marine Corps Gazette gave him the push he needed to begin work on Jubilee. He currently resides in Dallas. So welcome. Uh, thanks for being with us. Do you want to start by talking about the book yourself and then reading a little passage? Yeah, absolutely. Well, Jennifer, I'm excited to, to be here with the Fort Worth Library and excited to uh, talk about Jubilee. Uh, Jubilee is a World War II spy thriller that uh, I recently published this past summer. Uh, it revolves around the cataclysmic Dia Raid of 1942 and revolves around the stories of a, a British spy, uh, an American pilot in the British Royal Air Force's Eagle Squadrons, an American Army Ranger, uh, as all their stories revolve and eventually end uh, during Operation Jubilee, which was the infamous uh, raid on Dia. Uh, kind of got inspired to write this story after uh, serving six years in the Marine Corps. Actually started writing it while deployed in Sicily. Uh, while I was there, I actually had heard a story about the Dia raid, kind of picked my interest, and then from there decided to hey, you know, this is a very great backdrop for a story. Why not, you know, just write one and see where it would go from there. And, you know, after a few uh, years of writing it and editing it, I kind of had something I really wanted to share with the world. So uh, with that, um, you know, had have a uh, couple of readings right here. Just had the uh, kind of the introduction to the story, uh, kind of go through and read through it. Okay, sounds great. So, Arete, Arete, the German SS soldier shouted as the crack of a pistol ripped through the Parisian quiet. Arthur Cutter ignored him and quickly ducked down a narrow alleyway. Come on, Victor, he called in French. Victor scrambled after Cutter, his breath ragged and coming in short gasps. He wheezed and leaned against the wall, struggling for air. I'm shot, he gasped, a red splotch spreading on his shirt. But you aren't dead, so move. Another gunshot echoed down the alleyway as the German soldier caught up to them. Bollocks, Cutter pulled his Walther from his waistband and let off two shots. The German ducked for cover as one of the rounds snapped against the brick wall inches from his head. Let's go, Victor. If we stop, the Gestapo will torture and kill us. I can go no further, Victor wheezed as he slouched against the wall. He struggled to stand, but his leg buckled underneath him. Cutter looked at his friend with a combination of concern and urgency. Victor. If we stop, we're dead. I can't go on, Victor choked, his breath becoming more erratic as one of his lungs collapsed. Cutter gritted his teeth. Victor wasn't one to quit. Please, he begged. Victor looked up at Cutter, his face set in a grimace. I can't go on. You know what you have to do. Cutter shook his head. No, I won't do it. The shouts of their German pursuers grew closer. By the sounds, it was more than just one or two members of the SS chasing them. Victor coughed and spat out a globule of blood. We don't have a time. Stop acting like a child and do your job. Cutter froze. He couldn't do it. All the training, all the cautionary tales, none of it prepared him for this. His pistol dangled loopily at his side and he stared down at Victor. If you don't do this, they'll torture me and my family. Victor looked up at Cutter, his eyes pleading. Please, just get it over with. Do your job. Cutter's vision blurred as he adjusted his grip on the walther. His stomach tightened as he raised the pistol. Je suis désolé. The crack of the walther reverberated down the alleyway. He fired two more shots, one in the chest and another in the head to ensure Victor was dead. I'm so sorry, my friend, Cutter whispered and turned and ran. The Xapo wouldn't capture another SOE agent tonight. Cutter was hell-bent on making that a reality. He sprinted down the alleyway and made a few quick turns and found himself at a Christmas market. He took a deep breath and fought back the tears. With all the willpower he could muster, he holstered the Walther and casually walked out of the alleyway and strolled through the market. He could hear the German soldier shouting as he ran out of the alleyway, but didn't turn to look. He had to make it to the Seine. He had to get out of Paris and back to London. All right. 
Um, so there is a lot of history and real life historical characters that make up the book. Can you talk about kind of how you research that er that pe time period and then how that helps you incorporate real life events and people into your story? Absolutely. So uh, with the entire uh, period that Jubilee is around, it's mostly between 19, uh, late 1941 and to the end of roughly the fall of 1942. Uh, so it's roughly an eight month period of time that Jubilee takes place in. And during that period of time, there's a lot of events unfolding across Europe, you know, throughout World War II. Um, as I said before, one of the biggest things that got me interested in this story was a, uh, an article I read while on deployment to Sicily about the Dia Braid. Uh, the thing that really attracted my interest about the story was it was one of the first uh, combat engagements for American forces during World War II. Uh, 50 American Army Rangers landed on the beaches of Dieppe alongside British and Canadian forces and were the first uh, American forces to actually engage with the Nazis uh, in all Axis powers, including the Italians and the Japanese. Uh, so kind of that initial tidbit of information was really what picked my interest on this raid. It's like, wow, this is such a unique aspect of story. You know, you never really, I never really even heard of it. I always thought, you know, one of the first engagements of the war was uh, the famed Doolittle raids where, uh, you know, American United Army Air Corps bombed Tokyo. Uh, I always thought that that was one of the initial steps in the war. Uh, and so hearing this really made me scratch my head and wonder a little bit more about it. Uh, and as I started to read more and more about it, one of the things that uh, is earmarked with this raid was it was a precursor to D-Day, Operation Overlord. And uh, so I'm like, wow, that's fascinating. You know, why isn't this talked about? And it turns out that the reason the d raid isn't so well known was because it was a cataclysmic failure. Uh, you know, countless Canadian and British and American soldiers lost their lives during this attack. And it, for all intents and purposes, it was a really a frivolous expenditure of human life. So do you think, um, so like you said, everyone knows about Normandy, D-Day, but I'd never heard of these, the really this one and kind of the one that's in the, in the, that's right before Jubilee where they have the first one um, that's in, in the other town and which right. is also a failure. Um, but then they, they still do Dieppe anyway. Um, so do you think that even though they were failures, um, that they gave kind of some initial intelligence and information that they needed to understand so that when it actually, D-Day actually happened, they were way more prepared for what was coming? Absolutely. You know, at the end of the day, there were... When it came to the uh, Allied strategy for invading Europe, uh, you mentioned the, the St. Nazir raid, which was an attack on uh, the western coast of France uh, in the town of St. Nazir in the Loire Valley. Uh, this town was of strategic importance due to the fact that it had a, a dry dock that was able to house uh, you know, large German battleships which could, in all intents and purposes, cut off American supply convoys from America to Europe across the Atlantic. So uh, there was an immediate need to actually conduct that raid. Uh, and, you know, even though there was, when it came to was the amount of human life that was lost, the, you know, I think it was 45% uh, of the British landing force at St. Nazir was captured or killed. Uh, but they seized their objective. So it's more of, was the juice worth the squeeze? Well, strategically it was, but can you really put a price tag on human life was kind of the question walking away from that and Diop. Uh, the end of the day though, th both those raids served as invaluable lessons for what would eventually become Operation Overlord and, you know, breaking through the Atlantic wall and, you know, beginning the march across France and into Germany. So part of this story talks about the French resistance. Can you talk more about the role the actual French resistance played in helping the allies in the battle with the Germans and with the run up to 
you know, 1944 and the, the, and some of the, the actual ta- overtaking of Europe. Yeah, absolutely. The uh, the McKee fighters, the uh, the French resistance were invaluable uh, throughout the you know the early stages of the war and you know up until the seizure of Paris by the Allies. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, I mean, these are you know these are partisans. They're you know civilians who have turned to you know becoming guerrillas to you know fight German invaders, and they really lay down a very serious strategy of asymmetric warfare to disrupt. German supply lines, they gathered, you know, intelligence for, you know, British and American forces leading up to, you know, Operation Overlord, the Dieppe Raid, uh, Operation Chariot, which was the St. Nazir Raid. Uh, You know, at any turn, there was French resistant fighters uh, lending aid in some capacity to help the Allies, you know, overthrow and repel the German conquest of France and getting them, you know, letting the Allies march through France back in, in you know, cross the Rhine and invade Germany. And so, um, was there information about specific people in the resistance that you could then use for research? Uh, f- for specific uh, resistance personnel. I did not go fully into detail on that. Uh, Primarily what I did was uh, a lot of the individual focuses that I used for characters, uh, for real life characters was, you know, Charles Hambro, uh, Bernard Montgomery, uh, Lord Louis Mountbatten and and Trafford Lee Mallory. Uh, When it came to personality and stuff like that, I, I focused heavily on them because there was enough source material for me to actually breathe life into real life characters based off real documentation with the French resistance fighters, uh, finding more accurate source material other than actions taken, uh, you know, and events occurring with their participation. It was a little bit more difficult for me to get a handle on something that I thought would provide a great sight picture on something. Um, so kind of as a result, when in Jubilee, you know, I, I focus heavily on French resistance fighters, uh, particularly with Talia uh, and other uh, members of the McKee. Uh, with them, the biggest driver I kind of did to personify them was, you know, as Americans, as Texans, you know, imagine, you know, when Me- the, the Empire of Mexico invaded and, and seized the Alamo, you know, things like that. It's how would we feel if, you know, we were invaded and kind of began to personify that, uh, thought process and, and kind of breathe life into these characters, kind of trying to put myself in their shoes and s- imagine what it would be like. Um, so this story has really got like kind of three points of view. You have the spy, which I think is really interesting because we don't get a lot of World War II narratives from that viewpoint. It's usually infantrymen, and, and, you know, companies. Um, and then you have the, um, the American pilot um, who's, who's flying for Britain, um, which I, I think not everyone knows that that was happening, um, that before America entered the war, that we actually had uh, pilots coming over and helping and flying. Um, and then uh, I've lost my train of thought. I'm so sorry. <laughs> and and so talk about why you chose kind of those different viewpoints to look at it, to look at a story and tell the story maybe in a different way than we've talked about them before. Yeah. So uh, for those tuning in uh, who haven't read Jubilee, Jubilee focuses on on three. Uh, primary protagonist, uh, Arthur Cutter, who's a, a very young British spy with the Special Operations Executive, uh, Ian Faraday, who is a, a pilot with the British Royal Air Force, part of a RAF Eagle Squadron, which was a, a program where American and Canadian uh, civilians actually came over to England at the very beginning of the war before America even had entered the war and decided to join up and help assist in defending, uh, you know, the United Kingdom from Nazi Germany. 
Uh, and then it also follows an American Army Ranger, uh, a guy by the name of Malcolm Parker. And the purpose of, you know, having each of these guys tell a different story, it's, you know, by land and by air and, you know, behind enemy lines uh, was to kind of, in essence, kind of point out the gravity of what was going on in, in, in France, in Dieppe. Uh, it was a very massive operation. It had a lot of moving parts. And as a result, it was like this triple helix of events that was occurring, uh, you know, in the lead up to it and during it. And I, the, the initial thought process in what I decided to write Ju Jubilee was, you know, uh, spoiler alert, was what would happen if, you know, a pilot, a spy, and a soldier met up on the beaches of Dieppe, you know, and, and we're like, oh, my God, this raid is going horribly wrong. What do we do now? And that's kind of the climax of the story. Uh, and then I started working my way back from that and kind of just started telling each of their individual stories uh, and, rever you know, kind of just creating that as the culminating point of, uh, you know, a triple helix of very complex individuals and, and doing completely different things. Well, and I thought it was interesting, too, how you have kind of the the viewpoint of that frontline member, right? Whether it's the pilot or the ranger or the spy. And then you have all of the stuff that goes on in the background at headquarters and higher up the chain and, and not everyone always communicating with one another. And then how that kind of trickles down. Um, and obviously, uh, having been in the military, I'm sure you were drawing on some of your personal experience, but kind of talk about um, why you thought it was kind of important to kind of show how sometimes this hand doesn't really know what this hand is doing. And then sometimes it causes great things to happen and other times it causes not great things to happen. Uh, so anyone who... Uh, has ever been a part of a company or, or anyone who has been in the military, you know, there's bureaucracy, no matter where you go. It's a fact of life. It's I, maybe it's human nature. Uh, and so in Jubilee, uh, part of the, uh, the story that I tell is also the, uh, the political bureaucratic circus of the British war office in the lead up to Ju the uh, Dia parade operation Jubilee. Uh, and a lot of the stuff that I write about is based off real life events, things that I actually researched and read thoroughly about. Uh, part of the reason the Dia parade was such a what's was was a cataclysmic failure. I keep saying cataclysmic failure because it was a botched operation from the start was because there was a lot of political infighting among senior military officers. Uh, a lot of them were hoping to score political points at home by, you know, having the most daring and effective raid so that they could get, you know, a little, another medal on their, on their uh, lapel or, you know, get promoted. Uh, so it really was a, uh, a game of uh, political upmanship on the home front. Whereas, you know, as they did things, you know, they were looking at like a risk, you know, a risk board game style uh, board in a map room. Uh, but in reality, these weren't just, you know, uh, soldiers on a map. These were real people. So seeing the the transition from what they're thinking as these events are occurring to how it you know it, it went down to the the lowest uh, guy on the totem pole, whether it be uh, Arthur Cutter or Malcolm Parker or Ian Faraday, was a a juxtaposition to show that hey, this is what happens when people don't or when senior leaders don't actually value. Uh, the sacrifice is being made by those people in the field. And so like one of the things I thought was really interesting too, was that Arthur just wants to be done being a spy. Um, and they keep telling him after this assignment, you get a desk job. After this assignment, you get a desk job. Okay, well, we have to send you back. But after this assignment, you'll get a desk job. And then he gets the desk job and he decides maybe that's not actually what he wanted after all. Can you kind of talk about that thought process and why you made that as part of his character? 
Yeah. So with Cotter from the very beginning, he's, he's a damaged individual and he's only, you know, 20 years old, barely old enough to buy a beer. And, you know, he has a lot of emotional trauma. He's, you know, served as a spy for the British for, you know, nearly two years. And in that time, he's seen it all, done it all, unfortunately remembers most of it. Uh, seen people die in front of him, you know, people that he's cared for, friends. And as a result, it's just exhausted him. You know, the being a spy is, is a very lonely job. And part of the reason why I really enjoyed writing Arthur Cutter was it's a really lonely job, but imagine doing it as, you know, at, at 19, 20 years old, you are a kid, you know, it, it's, it's very rough. And so in, in telling that story, you know, the whole time he is trying to get away from the field work and he wants to survive the war. He wants to do that by sitting behind a desk and waiting out the war until the end. And, uh, his boss has different plans. He's one of the most effective spies in the field. So there's a bit of a, a carrot and a stick process of, hey, if you do this, one more operation, we'll bring you in. And so he goes to Dieppe. Uh, this is his final operation. If he does a good job, he, he's done with field work. So he has significant motivations. You know, he's haunted by demons from uh, being in Paris, having to kill an asset or risk him being captured and killed. Uh, he's a very haunted individual. And while in Dieppe, he meets Talia Crevier, who is similar to him in age, a uh, French resistance fighter who has a different thought process. She's entirely motivated to dispel the Nazis from France, you know, whatever it takes. And she suffered just as much emotional trauma. Her uncle died right before her eyes. Uh, days before Cutter arrives, her family has been killed while in Paris. You know, she's lost just as much as him, but she is much more willing to go on and, and do what needs to be done to, you know, see that her country's liberated. And so as Cutter does his job and eventually returns back to England, there's a bit of this guilty conscience of, you know, abandoning the cause for his own selfish uh, means. And as a result, that really begins to eat away at him. And he was like, I, I can't do this. I can't in good conscience abandon the mission and goes back. Uh, so for him, and this is what I really enjoyed about writing Cutter's Ark was it's a, it, you know, it's a story of overcoming moral demons and everything else, but it's also uh, a bit of redemption and finding the courage to do what needs to be done, even in the face of insurmountable odds. And he's lying to everyone, right? I mean, yep. his sister thinks he has some cushy desk job. And when he comes to visit, right, she's not really happy with him because she thinks he has a cushy desk job. And her husband is missing because he's been shot down somewhere and they don't, they don't know where he is. And so I, I think it's got to be, and I think that's why I really enjoyed it kind of having that viewpoint, which is very different from most of um, the things I've read when we're talking about war stories, um, is that in a lot of ways, it's about the fight within himself, just as much as it is everything that's going on in the world, in the world. And how does he, how does he stay like a happy, healthy person with all of these lies and deception and then all the horrible things that are going on around him. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, with the way you said it, it's, you know, we have, we have seen the enemy and he is us. And for Cutter, you know, being a pathological liar for all intents and purposes uh, he, he very easily alienates himself from his family, from his coworkers, from the people that he's serving this alongside. And it just, he creates this, uh, he's on an Island and it's, it eats away at him throughout the entire process. And with that, it's, uh, that was really what I wanted to capture in writing him was, you know, you don't ever really hear about psychological trauma in a lot of war stories. We're beginning to see that more now. 
But you don't, uh, with World War II, PTSD wasn't a thing. It was called battle fatigue uh, or cowardice. Uh, so it wasn't, commanders weren't very sympathetic to it. It wasn't a, an excuse for anyone to, you know, get out of the fight. If you couldn't carry on, it was like, come on, you, you need to carry your load, stiff upper lip and all that. It, it was very unsympathetic to the, you know, the burdens that come with emotional trauma and physical violence. Um, so obviously you did a lot of research for this. Can you talk about your research process? Absolutely. So, uh, a lot of, uh, my research actually came from, uh, stories I read, uh, a couple of the bo uh, books I read on the Dia parade and a lot of excavation into, uh, some sources on the like meeting minutes, particularly for, uh, the political aspects of it when it came to uh, Lord Mountbatten, uh, Air Vice Marshal Lee Mallory, uh, and General Montgomery, the political infighting about the war office. A lot of that was based on factual uh, accounts of people in the room, uh, which really created the, this is so insane it, it, and it's real, was is kind of the, was like, this has to be captured in the story. It, it's so bizarre surely it can't be real. And then, you know, it, it is, it's, it's, it's theater almost, which was the scariest thing. Um, so with that, it, that was a lot of where a lot of my source material came from was just, you know, reading history books on the raids. Uh, I've been to Normandy. I haven't had the opportunity to go to Dieppe, but walking across, uh, you know, uh, Omaha and Utah beaches, really inspired me to kind of write this story and, and, you know, seeing how the landscape and, and actually being able to visualize it was an aspect of it that was like, Oh my God, this is, is a story I really enjoy telling just because, you know, I've been in the area. I've had the opportunity to kind of look at some of the things that I write about. So like uh, the infighting, I thought it was really interesting how many of them would do an in run around everyone else and just go to Churchill. Um, <laughs> So did that happen a lot? So with uh, Lord Mountbatten, uh, if anyone's ever seen The Crown, he's the uncle to uh, Prince Philip. Yeah. Or uh, not Prince Philip, the, uh, the Queen's um, husband. Right. And, and, and Philip, Philip's last name was originally Mountbatten. He is actually part of that family. Yes. Exactly. So yeah. he had a lot of pull because he's had close ties. Obviously he's part of the arist aristocracy and he had close ties to eventually the monarchy, but not at the time. Um, so he, he was very much a, a political animal. He was a, uh, a decorated war hero. Uh, he, at the time of planning for Jubilee, he was actually in the process of being a advisor to the movie uh, in which we serve, which was a biopic about him during uh, the battle for Crete, where he was a, a naval commander. His ship got sunk. Um, as a result, he was awarded a medal and a movie. Um, so definitely a lot of political clout, uh, you know, he had a lot of capital burn, you know, he's a, a very famous individual because of Hollywood as a result of that, he's a member of the aristocracy, he's a high ranking individual. So he had a lot of clout in the British war office. And as a result, had a lot of clout with the prime minister. And uh, so was it just him going to the prime minister or was it other people kind of going around to him as well to go to the well, prime so when you look at uh, Charles Hambro, head of the SOE, because of his station, he already, it wasn't so much him circumventing anybody. He had a direct line to the prime minister because of his station. Uh, it's no different than with us when the director of the CIA is briefing the president. Um, for uh, Trafford Lee Mallory, on the other hand, uh, who's the air uh, vice marshal of the RAF, he was well known as a political animal uh, during the Battle of Britain. He actually was the one who used a lot of political maneuvering to uh, get rid of uh, Air Marshal Hugh Dowding and uh, Keith Park, who were, for all intents and purposes, were the reason why the British won the Battle of Britain. And upon the victory, uh, he was able to politically maneuver them out of the picture and install new leadership in the RAF 
just by the nature of him being a political animal. Interesting. That that that's really interesting to to get rid of the two people who 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 did what you needed to pr- protect the homeland. Right. So with that in mind, that was the that is one of the major stories that I, I used for kind of creating the personality of Lee Mallory in my in Jubilee, just because of there are countless documentations of him doing showmanship and everything else to, to get his way while in the Royal Air Force with Mountbatten. Uh, you know, uh, Bernard Montgomery was one to say, you know, three times this man has gone into battle and three times this man has lost. He's not a soldier or he's not a sailor, excuse me. You know, he's no, no business being in uniform. So, and yet here they are, you know, making these grand military plans to win the war. Well, and, and I, I thought it was interesting that you in, and kind of included some of that commentary in talking, some of your characters are talking about the movie that, that he's in, uh, that, that's about him. And uh, I think someone says something like, I don't understand why they made, you know, the, the boat sunk. Why, why, did they, why did they make a movie about him? What's the point? You lost the battle. Why are you getting a movie? It's, right. Yes. Yes. Uh, that, that, that I... And that was the point was to to push home the point of, hey, something's wrong here. Why are they in charge of this operation that is an extreme delicacy, has a lot of people involved in it, has a lot of risk? You know, a lot of people could die. And yet here they are making these plans. So do you think that also has some bearing on when we get to uh, D-Day? that the Americans are more so in charge than the British by the time we get there, because the, while the Americans are not part of the decision-making during these first two raids, they certainly have negative um, results from that. And, and do you think some of the people that were involved in those were saying to others, Hey, Hey, we, we need to be in charge. You know, I think that's a really good point. I have to go back and check, but I believe a stipulation for the invasion was Eisenhower had to lead, uh, on the American side. I want to say it had something to do with, uh, operation torch, which was the invasion of Sicily. Uh, it was Mon- I think Montgomery, it was actually Montgomery's plan, I believe for that invasion. And there was something about it where it was like, this is, there's a little bit of political showboating here. There's, uh, you know, Americans got the raw end of the stick and ended up getting more casualties than the British due to the way it was planned. We're not invading Europe unless we have an American planning the operation. Yeah, because yeah, we've, we've seen that they don't, they can't get the job done. <laughs> right. It was, <laughs> and that was... With uh, the St. Nazir raid in Dia, both of them had an extremely high body count. However, for all intents and purposes, they achieved their operational objectives, which was with St. Nazir, they were uh, knocking out the, uh, the dry dock. With Dia, the purpose of the Dia raid was to invade uh, the coastal town of Dia, occupy it for a few hours, force the Luftwaffe, the uh, the German Air Force to engage, which would force them into a, a pitched battle with the RAF overhead. So, for all intents and purposes, both objectives occurred. However, whether or not the results were worth it is a whole nother Question. story. Yeah, questionable. What, did we? Did we? Was losing all those men worth what? what we we gained because then you also don't have those men later right i mean they're they're not it's not they're not replaceable so yeah exactly it's at the end of the day there was a finite you know you have a finite amount of resources uh to put it that way it's you know especially with you know as a marine and you know when it came to uh, you know, implementing my Marines on whether it was convoys or operations, mostly in training settings, it, you, you realize very quickly though, it's, you have finite resources. 
how best can you use them and how best can you optimize them and how they're being used? So, um, are you, when you write, are you somebody who plots or are you somebody who kind of writes by the seat of your pants? So with Jubilee, I wrote by the seat of my pants. I enjoyed every minute of it. There was a lot of pain points though in the process where I, I would write 5,000 words and then realize uh, I can't use that plot point and then have to delete it. So I've learned from that. And in writing the sequel, I have com I completely mapped it out before I started writing. And so obviously for this type of story, mapping is probably a lot easier to keep your, uh, your, your thoughts together. Um, I always find it interesting kind of how uh, different writers kind of handle their process. Um, I know a YA author who writes a whole first draft and then deletes it and starts over. I and, and and by deleting, I really mean she deletes it. <laughs> I don't think I could do that. That, that would, <laughs> the blood, sweat, and tears that go into writing. I don't. I couldn't do that. Yeah, it's always funny uh, when she's on author panels and there's like one person on the panel that knows that she does that, and they're like. Oh, you have to tell them what you do. And then everyone else on the panel is like, you do what? Yeah, that's. You, you do what? Uh, um, <laughs> yeah, so I just think it's really interesting. Uh, and then, you know, there are others who do like, um, uh, I think Walter D. Myers was one of those that were like, he had boards and sticky notes that had like all of his stuff up on the wall of this person needs to do this. And. And so I just think it's really interesting. Have you figured out, because obviously it's your first novel, so it's some, some learning lessons. So other than some mapping out, are there other learning lessons that you, you learned? Uh, yeah. So, you know, in addition to the mapping, it's, it's, I've started to write more in-depth character bios before I even start, uh, with Cutter, midway through with, with when I was writing Cutter, I, I took a step back and kind of actually wrote out his character arc. And I'm very grateful that I did that because I think where he was in my first draft and where he was by the end of Jubilee was leaps and bounds, way better, a more dynamic character, a more in-depth and, and interesting individual. Um, in the sequel, uh, which I, uh, I'm working on right now, it's called the Vichy Treasury. Uh, before I even started, I, I started mapping out who my characters were, what drove them, you know, how they behaved in certain scenarios, uh, what, you know, what were, how they talked, you know, were they educated, were they uneducated, were they, uh, did they speak with a Southern drawl or, you know, did they have an accent, things like that, you know, small things, but, you know, details that all build up to who a person is. And so do you have any advice for other people who are think they want to write, are starting to write? Uh, I would say the hardest thing is starting. Uh, and then once you start, make a point to write every single day, uh, whether it's 100 words or 1,000 or, or 5,000. It's get in the practice of writing daily, whether or not it's good writing is irregardless. It just you start writing, you go back, you edit it. You keep improving upon it. That's that's really, I think a lot of people don't realize that it's that easy, although it's also that daunting. <laughs> blank page, right? Looking exactly. at the blank page every day. And do you do you have a routine? Do you write a certain time of the day? Do you have to have certain things around you? Uh, so I usually try to wake up around uh, 6.37 in the morning before uh, I go to work and I try to write, either, I either write a thousand words or I proofread 20 pages is kind of my goal. Uh, and if I don't get it done by, you know, in an hour, I'll go back and do it in the evening as well. So uh, in the last six months, I've been pushing to write a thousand words a day, uh, ended up with 60,000. So I was pretty happy about that. It's good. So you've talked about you're working on the sequel. 
Um, are you working on anything else? Is there anything you can give away about the sequel? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the sequel is called The Vichy Treasury, and it picks up uh, simultaneously as Jubilee, as well as two years or two years before. Uh, it it begins. It takes place in the uh, in Senegal in the Sahara. And the story of it is, is in 1940, as the Nazis were invading uh, France, uh, Belgium, and Poland, uh, there was a huge push to move treasury gold from each of those countries so the Nazis couldn't get their hands on it. So Poland migrated their gold before the Nazis invaded to France. And as the Nazis invaded Belgium, they moved it to France as well. And then as the Nazis invaded France, the French were like, what the heck is going on? Where do we move all this gold? And a lot of it was smuggled out of France to uh, Senegal and hidden in the desert. And so the Vichy treasury is a, a treasure hunt, if you will, uh, for the gold between allied forces, uh, Arthur Cutter's in it, as well as Talia, uh, as they hunt, race for the gold, as the Nazis try to hunt for it as well. Sounds interesting. Um, you have a, a timeline of when you think it might be available? I am hoping that it'll be done by end of October or November of this year. All right. Well, I've kind of reached the end of my questions. So if uh, we have any questions from the audience, I'll give you a couple of minutes if you want to put them in the chat before we close out for the evening, is there anything we should have talked about about the book that we haven't? Uh, I think that was a pretty comprehensive discussion. I really enjoyed going into the weeds on history. That was actually very fun. <laughs> well, good, good. Um, I try to kind of think of things that maybe you haven't been asked in other, no, other I like interviews. That. So, <laughs> um, so it looks like we don't have any questions. So I want to thank you for joining me. And I'd like to thank everybody else who came uh, for joining us as well. If you would like to uh, purchase copies of the book, uh, you can get them at the Dock Bookshop, which is our local independent uh, here in Fort Worth. Someone has come to say hello. Um, let some little ears. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and here is their contact information. Uh, you can both purchase in the bookstore or order, on, order online. Um, and we also have a lot of great author visits coming up uh, well into the summer. Um, to find out more information about them, if you visit, uh -oh. oops, sorry, went too fast. Bravo. If you visit our website, fortworthlibrary.org, um, you can either click on the dates of the catalog ca on the calendar to see what's going on, or if you click on search all programs at the bottom, uh, there is a page that just has our author visits on it, and it will give you all the dates and who's coming. So again, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Connor, for a great conversation, and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thanks, Jennifer. Have a good one. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.